I want to go ahead and just get started into the Word. Today we have the privilege of getting into 1 John. Now the book of 1 John is really not a book, it's really a letter. Uh, a letter that was written by John, um, and that's, we're going to go into who John was today before we get into the details of the Scripture. But I do want to start off by saying that any time you and I study the Bible, uh, we have to take certain things into consideration. And this is what we're going to do, and this is what I love about Midweek in the Word. We get to break down the actual Scripture. And the first thing that we as, as readers and believers have to take into consideration is the context of the book that we're reading. So the context is when it was written, to whom it was written, what the climate or the era of that time was. Like, was it a time of peace? Was it a time of war? Were people in captivity? Were they experiencing freedom and joy? What was going on at that time? And also, how does that relate to us today, right? It's kind of like when you get a text. How many of you guys have ever gotten a text and you get mad after you read it? And then you call that person, why are you yelling at me? They're like, what? I just typed the text. Yeah, but it seems like you're yelling at me. Who's ever gotten one of those texts? Don't be shy. And it's just people don't know how to text right. They're just texting without, you know, the niceties. And so you think they're upset and you think they're mad because sometimes we don't take the whole thing into context, right? And this is why we have to break down the word and look deep at it because sometimes we could read something and think it means something, but it means the total opposite of that. The second thing we need to do, whoa, my uh, computer went wild here. The second thing we need to do when we look at Scripture is we have to look at what is the main goal of the Scripture. Why did that apostle, prophet, man or woman of God write this? Like what, what, what is their reason? There's always a reason, right? We don't just write to write, do we? We're supposed to write with a purpose. Now, for First John, it's important that you and I understand a couple things. First John is written by John, the one that the Bible calls the beloved disciple, or the one whom Jesus loved. Have you guys ever read that? I mean, doesn't Jesus love everyone? Doesn't Jesus love all the disciples? But yet it states it as the one whom Jesus loved. You know, we can all say we don't have our favorites in our families, but sometimes you have the one that you love. The special one in your family that you love. And you can all deny it, but that's who John was. John was someone special, that it mentioned him as someone whom Jesus loved. It didn't say that about Peter. Peter was awesome. It doesn't say that about James. James was awesome. It doesn't say that about all the other disciples. And they were all awesome, weren't they? But for some reason, John gets that label of the beloved disciple whom Jesus loved. And we're going to look at that in a bit. John, 1 John was actually um, written by the same disciple, apostle that wrote the gospel of John. So, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the beginning, the four gospels. Well, later on, he also writes... Um, and it is believed that when he wrote this book or letter of 1 John, it was before 100 A.D. So it was in the first century. Specifically, many scholars think that he wrote it in 90 A.D. So that means that it was about 60 years after Jesus died that he wrote this letter. So here we have a picture of a man of God who has been saved for 60 years. Isn't that awesome? Amen. How many of us have been saved 60 years or more? Raise your hand. Anybody? Anybody? John outdid us. John outdid all of us. Raise your hand if you've been saved 50 or more years. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Raise your hand if you've been saved 40 years or more. All right, here we go. We're on the road to being like 1 John. The point I'm making is when he wrote this, he wrote with a lot of experience and a lot of commitment to the things of God. He didn't just slap together a sloppy text and send it to the churches. There was a lot of thought put into this and a lot of wisdom put into it. And I think we're blessed to be able to look at this wisdom. Basically, when he wrote this, it was during the time of the early disciples. This was a time that the early Christians of the first century were actually facing a specific battle. The battle that these Christians were facing in the first century 
Many people think, yes, it was persecution, and there was a great diaspora that was after, you know, the great persecution. A lot of the disciples spread after the revival of the book of Acts, and that's how the, the, the word of God was spread throughout the world. You know, the disciples didn't plan to go throughout all the world kind of on purpose. They kind of did because they were persecuted. The disciples were chased out of their hometowns. And so wherever they landed, whether it was in, in Europe or whether it was in Africa or whether it was in Arabia or whether it was even further, they preached the gospel. Amen. So praise God for that. But at this time, that's not the reason he wrote the letter because of this great persecution. There was a different type of a battle, and it had to do with false teachers. There was false teachers that were emerging within the churches that were actually spreading a false gospel. And the gospel that they were spreading was contrary. That means it went against to the one that Jesus was preaching. The reason this was a battle was because a lot of the people that heard Jesus preach and teach had already died. So now the churches at, at 90 AD have a bunch of new believers. So they don't really have a reference point to know what did Jesus mean, say, and teach other than what is being preached or taught. But certain teachers started to rise up and say, hey, you know, what I, you know what the Bible says about God? You know what Jesus wants us to do? And they sounded very convincing. Church, did you know there's a lot of YouTube preachers that are very convincing? Amen. There's a lot of um, TikTok preachers that sound like they know what they're talking about. But see, you have to have a reference point of the Word of God. You can't just go with it because it sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, that's fire, hallelujah. You know, I, you have to understand at that time, false teachers was one of the main things that the devil was using to bring division into the church. So when John wrote this, he was attacking the fact that there was false teachers in the church. This caused John to write a series of letters that actually encourage believers to fight for the truth and to love one another because these false teachers were actually creating divisions in the church. So they would actually go to churches that were already established, and they would start to preach their message, creating divisions amongst the Christian community. Guess what, church? The devil has been trying to split up the things of God since day one in heaven, right? When the devil tried to rebel against God, you think he was going to stop when the church started? Absolutely not. This is why you and I have to be careful and be wise to what it is that God truly said. This is why you and I have to read our word. Because if you don't read your word, you're not going to know what's true or what's not. You're going to go by what sounds good. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, also wrote his letter addressing the same exact thing. So it just wasn't John. Jude was doing his thing like, I got to write a letter to my church because they're going through some things. They're believing the false doctrine out there. So here's some facts to consider about John. Throughout the letter that he wrote in 1 John, and he actually wrote 2 John and 3 John, um, he refers to the people in the church as his children. He calls them children. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 says, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm writing to you because you're saved. And I'm hoping you'll listen to me because we're, we're both saved. Verse 18 says, again, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. So what is he doing? He's calling the false teachers Antichrists. That's pretty harsh, huh? Man, if you walked around today and called false teachers, you're an Antichrist. Oh, my gosh. How dare you? Don't judge me. He was going straight for the throat right here. John was calling it what it was. You can't come and teach a different gospel and think you're of Christ. You're anti-Christ. You know what else John wrote? The book of Revelation. Amen. And he addresses the spirit of the antichrist in the book of Revelation. And so see, John has a wealth of knowledge whelming up within him, and he's putting it in these letters but the fact that he calls us children implies that he not only loved the church as his own, but that he had a degree of pastoral authority over them. He was their pastor. 
Church, did you know that your pastors love you? I know sometimes it may not seem like it. You know, sometimes you might think, well, I don't know if my pastors even care or notice. We may not be able to get to talk to every single person in this church, but let me tell you, there is love here. Your pastors do not lay down their lives. Move to another city. Leave their home church. Because they don't love you. They do that because they love you. Right? Pastor Richard left the country. Pastor Jesse, Sister Lorena left the country, went to Chile. Okay, see, people do this because they love people. You're not going to uproot your whole life, disrupt your whole life and your children's life because you don't love the church, because you do love the church. Can I get an amen? amen. I know I'm supposed to be teaching, but I feel like I'm preaching. Sorry. But see, the fact that he said, my dear children, there was a, a, a love that he had for the church. John is also establishing that he was an a eyewitness to the life of Christ. So... John then now has to establish his credibility. And it's unfortunate that John, of his stature, of his maturity, of his wisdom, of his knowledge, of his experiences, felt he had to justify himself. But sometimes I can, if I can share a little something, sometimes as pastors, we feel like we got to justify, huh, pastors? Because sometimes people don't believe us. But it's okay. We'll justify all day long because we love you. And that's what John was doing. He loved the church, so he was justifying himself. And I want you to see how many times he says something in this next scripture. But I'd like to get a volunteer that's not afraid of a mic, and there's a mic coming up to me because I can't run to you, to read 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Any brave volunteers that want to read that? Interactive. Interactive. You can ask all the folks at Anaheim. I used to make them read. Okay. Sister Aurelia, here we go. Can somebody pass her the mic, please? Thank you. You don't want to see me fall. Thank you. <laughs> First John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Okay, who's a mathematician? Thank you, sister. Who's a mathematician and wants to read? How many times did he said, we have seen it, we have looked, we have seen the appearance, he has appeared? How many times has he referenced that he's seen it with his own eyes? Six times in one scripture, do you think he's trying to make a point? John is basically trying to say, hey, look, listen to me. I've seen it with my own eyes. Stop doubting in what I'm going to teach you and tell you in this letter. He most likely wrote this letter, it says, from the island of Patmos, which is where he was exiled, because the Romans had actually tried to execute him before, but they couldn't by throwing him in a hot pot of oil, and he didn't burn. Come on. Think about that. And that was well known. But yet he still felt he had to convince people. But that's how it is today, isn't it? People have seen a miracle in your life. People have seen you turn a life of sin into a life of grace and love and compassion for other people, for, for God himself, and people still don't believe in the God that you serve, huh? I don't believe it because it's just, you know. And it's like, do you not see? I am a living miracle, amen? How many living miracles do we have in this place? But see, people still doubted. It's human nature. And he felt, I have to convince them. I got to convince them. I got to convince them. In one scripture, I got to remind them that I've seen it. I've I've, I, he even said, I touched it. He's talking about touching Jesus. So see, John had experienced miracles, and people knew he was also the evidence of a great miracle that didn't die when they tried to kill him. And the fact that he's on this island exiled is because the Roman government said, we can't kill this guy. Just put him on that island to die of old age. That's powerful. Now, his letters were written with three purposes. 
Okay, number one, he wrote with the intent specifically to come against the prevailing thought, the false teaching of that day. And that false teaching is known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism believed that Jesus was born a man, that then he became divine at his baptism, but then he became a man again at his crucifixion. So Gnosticism was basically teaching he was just a man, but the Holy Spirit came upon him so that he could do all those miracles, but then it left him when he died. Because after all, how can God die? So that's how they justified their lack of understanding that God would die. They created a whole new doctrine. And if you think about things logically, okay, it could make sense, right? Like, why would God die? That's not truly God if he can die, right? And that's the way they looked at it. Gnosticism was the false teaching that started to permeate into the church that was starting to remove the divinity from who Christ was. And what John was doing was he was addressing it direct on, saying, look, I've seen it, I've touched it, I've experienced it, he's appeared to me, and you can't tell me otherwise, and now I'm going to share it with you. And let me remind you, church, and that's basically what he was doing. That was his purpose. The second purpose of his letters was to remind the believers in Christ that they must maintain their fellowship in love. And the reason he was doing that was because there was so much division in the churches because of this false teaching of Gnosticism that there started to be like rivalries, right? East side versus west side. This side of the church versus that side of the church. Oh, these are the ones that believe in that teaching, and we're the ones that believe in this teaching. And instead of saying, you know what, this is ridiculous, let's go back to our roots, they started to turn on each other. But isn't that what the devil wants? Doesn't the devil want us to fight each other instead of fighting the real enemy? If he could take our eyes off of him and he puts our eyes on each other, then he's like just sitting back like, this is easy. I don't got to do anything. They're killing each other. They're killing each other in the spirit. They're killing each other in attitudes. They're killing each other in whatever may be going on. And that's why John said, look, 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 look. No, 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 no. Let's remind ourselves that we are a family in Christ. We should love each other. John Waite went to great lengths to emphasize the importance of loving one another. I, I believe that he did this. Because, I believe that's actually why the Bible calls him the disciple that Jesus loved. I believe John was a type of loving guy. Like, he's just a loving guy. I, I think he, he wasn't afraid. I mean, I, don't take my word for this, you know. I'm, but this is just what I'm thinking, just hearing how he was and what he pushed and how he was described, I think Jesus called him the disciple that Jesus loved because there was just so much love in him. And he couldn't stand there was division or fighting or infight. He had too much love. And I believe that's why he was given that name. And the third purpose of the letter was to encourage the believers to strive to walk in righteousness. I like the word strive. Strive. Why, why do we need to strive to walk in righteousness? Because it's so easy to not, right? Traffic, attitudes, kids, finances. It's so easy not to be righteous because of all those trials and situations that go on inside of our lives. So let's start reading in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. And if I can get a volunteer, anybody, anybody volunteers anywhere? We got Albert ready to go with the mic. Okay, right here to my left, your right. Okay. First John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It says, ooh, sorry. <laughs> it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the 
with his son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So there's a lot that's said there. And I know we talked about the appearing and he's testifying about what he's seen. But when you look at that whole scripture here, John states his purpose for writing the letter. John reminds his readers of the awesome good news that you and I have received. You know, we have to remember what it is that we're doing here in church because we got nothing better to do. Because your wife made you come? Hopefully not. Because it's cold at your house and this is nice and warm? I mean, what it, you have to understand, what is the real reason? Why? And he's reminding them. This is the message that we heard in the beginning. Think about this, church. When was the first time you heard the gospel? And think about how it made you feel. Now, think about the time you accepted the gospel, and how did that make you feel? You see, John's trying to take the church back. Remember? Remember that message we first heard? Don't don't get too far in your Christianity that you forget where you came from. And he, 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 he starts to talk about the word of life that he says that we proclaim to you. So he's kind of giving himself some credit, like, remember? When you guys were out in the streets and I came and I started preaching, we proclaimed the word to you and you got saved. And he was trying to remind them of that. We have to sometimes remember, man, when did I get saved? Oh, my gosh, it was so powerful. And he's reminding them that Jesus saved us from our sins. You know, it's a good time to shout hallelujah when you hear that. He has saved us from our sins. They no longer stand condemned before God. The word of life. And this is coming from a man that had a death sentence. Do you get what I'm saying? See, when you put it into context, you got a man that was on death row talking about have some joy because you have life. It's interesting he's talking about life when he's on death row. Do do you see how awesome that seems now that you think, oh my gosh, that's right. This guy was isolated on an island with a few guards. He didn't have a Walmart to go to. He couldn't go to the nearest coffee shop and talk over some nice warm coffee. Every once in a while, people would deliver letters to him, and the Roman government allowed him to get letters and food and things, and that was it. He was alone. He was in isolation. He was in the shoe. I mean, he was locked up. Nobody could see him, talk to him, unless they had special permission. He was by himself, and yet he was speaking so much life. You know what that tells me? That no matter what we go through, we got to remember our life inside of us. The word of life. It's the word of God that gave us life. Remember that? And that's why I think he can teach and write like this. And then I believe John wants his readers to understand the benefits that they have by accepting Jesus. He wants everyone to know that they should experience, look at what he calls it, the fullness of joy that comes with being saved and being in fellowship with like-minded believers. Sadly, by him writing this, it also means that there are people that can be saved and not experience the fullness of joy. I I would bet today there are people in this place, in this building, you do not have joy in your life. And what he was doing as as a pastor, remember he calls them my dear children. He was their spiritual father. What he was doing was trying to remind them like, hey, have a little joy in your life. The reason we lose joy sometimes is because we lose focus on God and we focus on our problems. We're focusing on the issues down here instead of focusing on God. How can a man like this who's already been tried to be killed, all his friends, by the way, were already persecuted, if not killed and martyred. He was one of the last living disciples, and yet he has all this joy. Most people would be depressed, suicidal, like, I'm done, I don't want to eat, if I starve. But he had, here he is writing to us saying, hey, you guys have to have some more joy. Isn't that powerful? See, that's what God does. He, he can give us a joy when we're not supposed to have it. He can give us happiness when we're not supposed to be happy. 
He can give us peace when there is no peace around us, but yet there's peace inside because you no longer stand condemned. And he knew it. And he wanted the church to know it. Hey, church, don't forget you're saved. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. Don't be so depressed all the time. I mean, I understand we go through things and we feel sadness, and there's a lot of men of God that felt sadness. I'm not saying feel bad for feeling feeling sad, but this is the message he was telling them. He said, I want you to have the fullness of joy. Who wants the fullness of joy in in their relationship with God? Amen? The whole thing. Maybe you know people like this, or maybe, unfortunately, like I said, it might be you that may be feeling this lack of joy. You know, you claim to know Christ and to be in fellowship with them, but you display no excitement in your faith. Oh, praise God, it's time for church. Yeah, I guess. Like, oh my gosh, it's going to be a winter wonderland experience taking place. <sighs> Another one this year. <laughs> Think about this, church. If you weren't saved, where would you be? If you weren't saved, where would you be? Dead, depressed, single? I mean, who knows? Right? See, we have to regain our focus sometimes, church. Sometimes we take the good things for granted, and we're like, oh, here's another church event. Oh, here's another sermon. Oh, here's another Bible study. But think about it. Where would you be if you weren't saved? Probably in a very bad situation. See, put it into perspective, and that's what he was trying to do. What's interesting about John saying the Christians and saying to the Christians of that time that they needed to have more joy was that at that time, the Roman emperor, uh, Diocletian, was the emperor of Rome, and he was actually a very cruel and a very vicious dictator that despised and targeted Christians. He despised them. And he targeted Christians. And it was in the midst of this persecution of Christians that John is telling everybody, hey, I know you all are getting persecuted, but have some joy. Some people probably thought, I think John lost it up there on that island. What's going on with John? Doesn't he know what's going on out here? Of course he knows. He already tried to get killed. They already tried to kill him. Of course, they said they'd put him in a pot of oil in the middle of a coliseum. And they were going to all watch him burn. That's kind of sadistic, right? Everybody's going to cheer for him to to die. But he didn't die. And here he is telling everybody, y'all need to have joy. You know why he was welling up with joy in his life? Because he knew if God could save me, God could save you, church. Doesn't matter who persecutes us. Remember what Jesus said. You're blessed if you're persecuted. Because I got persecuted and my followers were going to be persecuted. Count it as a privilege. But see, he was trying to encourage them and remind them. He didn't let his own persecution affect who he was as a believer in Christ, which is, I want to encourage people. One of the hardest things you can do, church, is when you're going through a trial and when you're facing hardship, to be an encourager. It's hard. I've been there. I know. It's like the last thing I want to do is pick up the phone and encourage somebody. I want some encouragement, right? I'm in no place to encourage nobody. But that's actually when it becomes even more powerful when you do it. Because then you become like this apostle who in the midst of hardship encouraged the church. In the midst of persecution and him feeling the the full wrath of the Roman government on his life was able to say, hey, we can have joy, guys. We can have the fullness of joy. And I think when we realize and learn from John, man, if he did that, I want to experience that. John, number one, he opens this letter in a very similar way that he opens the gospel of John by stating that Jesus existed from the beginning. He reminds everybody that Jesus is the creator. He reminds everybody, you're not serving a man that had the spirit fall on him and then it was removed like Gnosticism was teaching when he died. No, he's saying, you are serving the creator of heaven and earth, the God of gods. There is no one like him. 
So what he was doing was reestablishing who God was to the church at that time. Because during that time, the Roman government and the Greeks had multiple gods, multiple deities. And so Jesus was just like one of them to a lot of people. So he was like, no, 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 don't believe Gnosticism, which puts him right back down there. He is the creator. And he starts 1 John by reminding everybody he is the creator. However, here John goes on to stress Jesus' humanity. So he doesn't deny his humanity. Reminded us that he was an eyewitness to the early ministry of Jesus. Some of the false teachers in the church were claiming that Jesus did not come in the physical body. Can you guys read verse 1 and 2? Who would like to read verse 1 and 2? Anybody that has uh, their Bibles or their screen that would like to read it out loud? Verse 1 and 2. Everybody's being shy today. It's okay. Verse 1 and 2. Amen. Okay. Okay. Amen. So what he's doing here is he's establishing, yes, he was man, but he was also God. And he was directly in verse 1 and 2 coming against the false teaching that he was a man that had the Spirit of God come upon him, but then it left. What John is saying, no, he was from the beginning as the creator He was also human because we touched him, but we also saw the divine miracles that he performed. He is still God in the flesh. So he was establishing a very important doctrinal issue, a very, very important doctrinal issue at that time. Second question, John states that he has declared these truths to his readers so they may have fellowship with him and his fellow apostles. He's drawing a distinction between two groups, those that follow the gospel he teaches and those that are following false teachers. So if somebody could read verse 3 and 4, the question is, what does verse 3 and 4 say? Are the benefits of belonging to the first group anyone? Okay, over here. Thank you. Albert's doing a great job, huh? Thank you, Albert. Verse 3 and 4. What are the benefits of belonging to the group that follow the gospel he teaches? All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing that was made has come into being. In him was life and the power to bestow life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. So 1 John, verse 3 and 4, he says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. How many of you know that your leaders and your pastors want you to have fellowship with them in the Spirit? Amen? Amen. Haven't you ever been in a conversation with somebody and it feels like, oh, man, I had a really good conversation. We had a kindred spirit, right? Like it was, it was like you felt like it was a good, a good conversation because it was somebody that had a like-minded spirit. That's, that's what he's going on. He's saying, I want you, church, to have the same understanding so that we can have fellowship together. I think that's every leader and, 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 and pastor's desire, right, that we can understand one another. And then verse 4 says, we write this to make our joy complete. John was basically saying, look, we want you as the church to understand that we want you to believe like we believe. That's going to make us happy. It sounds kind of selfish, but what John is doing is he's asserting his, his apostolic authority. 
He's asserting his apostolic authority and telling the church, look, you're going to have teachers all over the place come at you. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you know, whatever. High school, college, you're going to hear all kinds of teachings. But he's going to say, don't forget what we taught you. Don't forget we're the ones that guided you in your early spiritual training, in your early spiritual walk. He was being very straightforward to the point. If you read this, it's hard to understand that without knowing the history. But when you know the intent and the history of what was going on, it makes sense, doesn't it? Ah, so John was making a point. John was saying, hey, look, I'm the pastor here, and I showed you these things. Why are you listening to that garbage? Why are you listening to that nonsense out there? Don't forget what you've learned. Our joy is that you would be in fellowship with us. Remember that? See, and, and it's interesting that we understand he was fighting for his church. First John was a letter of supplication to the church. Hey, don't, don't believe the hype. There's a lot of hype out there, huh? Yeah. Guess what the message is today? Every time pastors come up here, don't believe the hype. There's a lot of hype out there. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone comes from the University of Google with a B Google degree, whatever. And they think they have a right to, 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 to get on their platform and teach the masses. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. They might have the knowledge. They might even have the message. But the one thing they don't have that John has is love. They don't have the love for those people because you know what? They don't know them. They don't know who's on the other side of that video camera with the little round circle of light coming at them so they look good in YouTube or wherever they're at. You know, people buy those new, maybe I'm going too crazy here, but those of you know what I'm talking about, these uh, self-proclaimed YouTubers, right? They have that big round circle light. That's all they see. But they don't see the masses on the other side that are listening to them. So how can they love them? How can they disciple them? How can they check in on them and say, how are you doing? Don't forget, I love you. That's what John was doing from the island. He was sending a letter. And who knows, it probably was going to take three weeks to three months to get to the churches. Nevertheless, he wrote it. Hey, my dear children, don't forget I love you. And don't forget the message we taught you. And don't believe the nonsense out there that you guys are listening to. Make my joy complete as your spiritual father. That's basically what he was saying. It makes John really human, doesn't it? Right? Think about the message you would give your kids if they were out listening to other people about everything that you taught them, everything you showed them to do that was right. And all of a sudden, they're like, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. Ah, this guy right here, he knows everything. He has a million subscribers. What would you do? You'd be like, boy, let me tell you, I raised you, I gave you birth, and I'll take you out. <laughs> That's what John was doing. John was reminding the church, hey, don't forget. Don't forget which, where you come from, and don't forget the message we taught. And don't forget, I have, the, I have the credentials, is what John was saying. I've been with Jesus. Powerful, huh? Powerful message. Okay, let's look at number three. And by the way, we have to be careful with the joy killers. Remember, he said, make my joy complete. There's people out there that are going to try to take your joy. Don't hang around with joy killers. Don't, don't, don't do that. Instead, let's do what he says, which is remember all the blessings that we have received. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10, this is what he says as we continue. This is the message we have heard from him and declare it to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, 
purifies us from all sin. Not some sin, not the worst sin, all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Again, John reestablishes the basis of our faith, which is we are all sinners. But he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. Isn't that good news? Isn't that awesome? John reminds us the truth of the gospel. John reminds us about the basic truth of the gospel. God is light, and in him is no darkness. You know why he was saying that? Because remember, the false teaching, he was a man, then the Spirit of God came upon him, then it left, then he was a man again. That means that God would have darkness in him. And what he's trying to say is like, no, God was, Jesus came as God in the flesh with no sin, with no darkness, and that's why he's able to save you and I. This means that when you and I have Christ in us, and we also believe in him, that we also have no darkness in us either. Now, I know people are saying like, well, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know about that. I just kind of messed up on the way up here. He's not talking about darkness in the sense of one sin equals darkness. He's talking about living in a life of sin that brings a light of darkness in your life. You see, living in sin is what darkness is. And he reminds his, um, his, uh, his, 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 his readers, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So what he's basically saying is, I'm not trying to say you got to be sinless because I know you got sin. And if you say you're without sin, you're lying. That's what he's basically reminding everybody is, hey, we're sinners, right? That's why we need to come to church. To, to get right again sometimes, to, to lay that sin down and say, okay, God, ah, I let a little bit of darkness, but I don't want to live in that darkness, so I'm going to shun it out with the light of God. Amen? So here's a question. Instead, we would walk in the light. So according to verse 7, if you jump to verse 7, what are the benefits of walking in the light? Who wants to answer that based on verse 7? I'm going to read that scripture. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. There are two things that are the benefits for walking in the light. What are they? Anyone? Scream it out if you have to. Yes, sir. Amen. So we have fellowship with people in church, and we're delivered from sin. Did you know what he, part of walking in the light means you got to be in fellowship with one another? That means you have to look for opportunities to hang out with other Christians. That's part of walking in the light. If all you're doing is looking forward to spending time with your unsaved family, are you walking in the light? But they're my family. Yeah, but are you walking in the light if that's all you look forward to? We love our families, saved or unsaved. I get it. But we should also be looking to walk in the light and fellowship with other believers. Look around. There should be no reason why no one has people to fellowship with. We actually have a fellowship hall. You can hang out there after. We, the church made it easy for you. And yet, it's so simple, but yet so deep. The benefits of walking in the light. We get along with people in the church, hopefully. And number two, our sins are forgiven and we're purified from sin. Amen? What, what, what a blessed reminder that he gives us here in these verses. And according to verse 8 and 9, how does God respond to us when we realize humbly and confess humbly that we are sinners that need his mercy? 
verse 8 and 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteous. You notice there's two things that come to sin. Number one, he forgives us of our sin. But then it says he purifies us from our sin. You know why he's saying that? Because sin is the action, right, that, that disobeys God. But when we disobey God, there's a purification that needs to take place in our life. Just because he forgives us of our sin doesn't mean immediately everything's 100%. There's a purification of stinking thinking that's got to get cleaned up. There's a purification in our language, right? You know, we lived a certain lifestyle, and, and maybe you picked up a, a couple cuss words. And now God's trying to purify you from that. He forgave you of it, but you still got to get purified from that. You see, being forgiven is a step. Being pur purified is the process. And that's why he distinguishes them in two different ways. To understand church, yes, we're forgiven, but he also purifies us. And the purification process only happens when we run to the light, the light of Christ. So that is going to conclude today. Um, if, if we can go ahead and uh, bow our heads.